bit about myself before I jump into our work. I started cycling at a relatively young age for everyday transportation sometime in uh, early high school. And um, being born and raised in San Francisco, it was pretty natural, pretty easy for me to get around by bike. Uh, so I didn't think about it too much. Um, it was only when I moved to Los Angeles for school and other things that really became a choice uh, and it became something I had to fight for. And so in that way, cycling really was an introduction to community organizing for me. Started working in my neighborhood, um, on my campus, um, to organize my peers and other folks to push for the things that we knew that we needed as cyclists, more bike lanes, more programs, to make it easier for us to bike in a place that, um, at the time even more so than now, was really inhospitable to cycling as an everyday mode of transportation. Leaving LA, I came back to San Francisco, a city that I love, um, and it only made sense to look for work at the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. I knew about all the great work that they were doing, so I uh, joined staff uh, two and a half years ago in a different capacity and worked my way up to community organizer, the role that I have now. So today we'll look generally at our work. Um, we'll look more specifically at our advocacy work. Then we'll dive even deeper into our street campaigns and talk about how we prioritize those individual campaigns. And I'll wrap up with a case study of one of our street campaigns, in this case, protected bike lanes on Turk Street uh, from Polk to Market. So we're the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. We promote the bicycle for everyday transportation. The long form of our mission statement reads, the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition works to transform San Francisco streets and neighborhoods into safe, just and livable places by promoting the bicycle for everyday transportation. Relatively straightforward, but we also have a set of guiding values that have come out of our most recent strategic plan, which runs from 2018 to 2022. Those values being transportation justice, sustainability, people power, and joy. I don't have to tell people in the room that cycling is good for one's health, but I think we see shades of that reflected in these values. Joy, uh, bike makes people happy, people power, builds community, builds relationships, sustainability is good for the environment, transportation justice, it's affordable, it's if done right, accessible. Um, all of these things really factor into our work and especially our advocacy work. Do you wanna call out our members? Are there any members in the room? Just a quick poll. Awesome, well thank you all for being members. Um, you really drive our work. I'm hoping that maybe we'll convince a few other of you to join as members after this. Um, but we are a member-driven advocacy nonprofit. We have 10,000 paying members, which is a really large number for any organization and pretty astounding for an active transportation org. Uh, so that's really great. Amongst them, we have 1,000 yearly volunteers who give, uh, on average, 10 hours per year. So we have 10,000 annual volunteer hours. This fuels our work, it drives our events, bike to work day, a lot of the things that you might um, have seen in the streets. Um, but it also powers our advocacy work. Uh, our members are member advocates. They speak up for the projects that impact their lives. And so me as an organizer, I lean on them pretty heavily to push forward my street campaigns. So our advocacy work, through our advocacy work, we win safe streets. Really quickly, I wanna to touch on some of the citywide and regional work that we do before I jump onto a, into a street by street and neighborhood by neighborhood level, um, but we do work on broader city policies such as Vision Zero, we'll talk more about that later, um, and funding mechanisms especially. It's really important that the money is there uh, to fund and build the infrastructure that we know we need and that it's a sustainable source of funding that it rolls over every year. So that's a big part of our citywide work. And then regionally, we do work on regional bike connections. So that's the bridges. That's the uh, east span of the Bay Bridge, hopefully a future western span for people biking, um, fighting back tolls on the Golden Gate Bridge. And then it's transit, so making sure that you can take your bike on BART, Caltrain, anybody who is working or riding outside of the city, wanna, we want them to be able to have that multimodal option as well. But really the Bread and butter, the core of our advocacy work are street campaigns, this is what we're known for. And this is us fighting street by street for bicycle infrastructure. Um, so in the past it's been bike lanes generally, but now more and more we're, we're gearing towards protected bike lanes, physically separated bike lanes that um, have a high degree of safety, both perceived and real. Um, generally our street campaigns address a problem and an issue. Uh, that's pretty straightforward for most streets. It's that they're really dangerous for people riding. They don't have appropriate infrastructure. So those are the problems and the issues. Um, our street campaigns aim to build people power amongst our membership and neighborhood stakeholders to make real and lasting change, which again, looks like real infrastructure improvements is bike lanes that are in the ground for decades, not just for the people riding on the streets currently, but also for the future riders that don't feel comfortable, don't feel safe, and that a high level of infrastructure will allow them to actually get on the bike and start riding for everyday transportation. 
few examples of some of our past victories, um, and we're always continually working on these projects as well. They're never done, but um, the Wiggle is a big one. Uh, this is a neighborhood connection from Market Street to Golden Gate Park. This is less on the protected infrastructure side of things because these are neighborhood streets. This is more about wayfinding, traffic calming, slowing vehicles down, slowing or reducing the number of vehicles on these streets and making sure that people riding can effectively um, share the road. Since this picture was taken, we now have raised crossings uh, at this intersection, which um, makes it safer for pedestrians, but also doubles up as a type of um, traffic calming, speed hump type um, improvement for slowing vehicles down. This is uh, San Jose Avenue in the south of San Francisco. Um, a few years back, this was a bike lane on the shoulder of a highway. I mean, these are um, highway on and off ramps, and so vehicle speeds were reaching 60, 70 miles an hour. It was really, really dangerous, prohibitive for the vast majority of people who ride bikes. And so we pushed really hard to get physical protection, at first with a buffer and plastic bollards, and very recently um, with concrete safety barriers that you see here. And so now this is a really comfortable bike path. Um, I would take uh, my mother and grandmother on this and they would feel okay riding next to a really busy uh, highway. So huge improvement there. Um, this is another street um, in the south of San Francisco. This is Mansell in John McLaren Park. Um, another huge transformation, um, really important. So this median here uh, used to split four lanes of really high-speed traffic to in each direction. And so through the street campaign, we were able to reclaim a whole half of the street, take up these two lanes as a dedicated bicycle and pedestrian path. And so now, even in the rain, it's comfortable for families to ride on. Really, every level of rider can ride on this, um, especially important in this neighborhood that doesn't have as much access to dedicated space for people riding. And then finally, I do want to call out these recent uh, victories, these protected bike lanes in South of Market, uh, 7th and 8th Street. Uh, we were able to lobby the mayor's office to implement these really quickly. And so that's why we see what we call a parking protected design, where these vehicles are not in a travel lane, they're actually parked. And so you repurpose the parking lane as the protection for the people riding, um, which allows the city to do this cheaply, quickly. It's mostly paint. There's really not much uh, concrete or, or plastic that goes into this. Um, and politically, it's more viable because you maintain the parking resources that are really important to oftentimes big stakeholders, such as businesses, uh, employers, you name it. They like their parking. This allows them to keep some of it and gives us a protected curbside bike lane. Not perfect, but these two streets went in from planning to construction in nine months, which is, in city terms, frankly, amazing. Um, so hoping to see more of that. We're working on this model um, as we speak for other streets. So how then do we prioritize our street campaigns? We have finite resources, and we need to decide where to focus our efforts, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street. One really helpful policy framework that we use is Vision Zero. The Vision Zero passed in 2014 is San Francisco's commitment to zero traffic-related deaths by 2024. It's an ambitious goal, but it paves the way for a lot of the safety infrastructure that we advocate for. And because the core issue of our street campaigns is street safety, this is such a helpful guide. Again, it gives us policy cover. We're able to lobby our elected officials who have signed off on this. Um, and it gives us the data so that we can know where um, and what to advocate for. So out of Vision Zero, we get the high injury network. And this takes data from a number of sources. And what ends up happening is that it shows the 13% of streets where 70% of all serious injury or fatal collisions occur. So these are the streets that we know as an organization we need to be focusing on to address the safety issues in San Francisco. Um, the high injury network pulls from police department data, uh, reports of collisions, as well as hospital data from SF General. Data is not perfect. We know that collisions are underreported, especially in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, solo collisions rarely go reported, so it's not perfect. But at the moment, it really is the best source of data that we have to target our efforts. Um, so just take a quick look at these two maps. Um, this is the Vision Zero High Injury Network uh, from 2011 to 2015. And this was only police data, so a little bit flawed, but again, at the time, the best that we had. And there was a recent refresh uh, in 2017, which incorporated data from SF General. And so it gives us a better picture of where these hotspots are. Um, you'll see that it's a little bit more nuanced. It's not full corridors. It's segments of streets. Uh, the southeastern portion of the city 
lights up a lot more, whereas before it was a little bit sparse. Um, and then in both cases, really, every single street in our urban core lights up as a high-injury corridor. Um, everything in the Tenderloin, North of Market area, and everything in Soma, which makes sense, but again, it's great to have the data to back that up and inform our efforts. Another thing that we take really seriously is member input. Because our 10,000 members are constituents, uh, I listen to them very carefully as an organization. We listen to them very carefully. And their concerns and complaints, they often follow the high injury network. They experience dangerous streets as such. So it makes sense. But it also helps us fill important gaps in the data that don't show up on the high injury network. An example of that is 17th and Church, where it wasn't on the, on the network, but we were hearing from members that there were a lot of solo crashes, um, people riding family bikes, falling in the muni rails. We had some videos. And through their advocacy, we were able to lobby the city and actually get the improvements that we needed to make it safer. And very recently, protected bike lane was installed on this block, which keeps people out of the tracks where they were crashing on their own and getting home without talking to the police or going to the hospital. So member input does fill those gaps in a really important way. The last thing that we really take into account when considering do we want to make this street a real campaign and push for it is uh, whether or not there's a city project for the street. So uh, that means, is there funding allocated through the capital budget? Is there a lead agency that we can lobby? Is it the SFMTA? Is it Public Works? Is there a project manager and staff that are working on designs? Who can I call up when I have these questions? Um, what's the scope? What's the timeline? And not to say that we can't advocate for a street when there's no current project. We did that for Valencia successfully, but it's a lot more of a lift. Uh, it's a lot harder to push the city to start from scratch and create the budget for a project. So if all this is in place, we can interface with the process much better and get better results. Um, and then another thing to take into account is where is the project in the pipeline? Uh, depending on where it is, we may push harder or, or less hard. So if it's in public planning and approvals, we have real, real great opportunities to bring our members into the process and influence change. Whereas a project that has been through that and is already in detailed design and construction is a little bit more sealed off. It's much harder to drive change. Again, not impossible, but it just becomes a much bigger lift. So with all of that in mind, I do want to take time to go through an actual example of a street campaign. Um, this is Turk Street Protected Bike Lanes from Polk to Markets. This is a great example of our work um, in a neighborhood like the Tenderloin. So it makes a great case study of, um, of our street campaigns. To talk through this, I put together this framework of how a campaign should go. And Turk followed pretty well. This is just a framework. Oftentimes, street campaigns don't necessarily go in this flowing direction. But the first step is issue identification, deciding what the core issue is. Um, then we run a power analysis. We determine where we're at with our members um, and resources at hand in terms of moving change. Then based off of that, we aim to grow our base and increase our power. Um, leading into convincing decision makers. And if we get all of those four steps right, we're able to move on to the last one, which is winning and celebrating. It doesn't always happen, but it's great when it does. And the arrow here is just to note that uh, member engagement and developing leaders and champions should be increasing throughout this process. So by the time you get to convincing decision makers, you've got people that are ready to speak up and ready to advocate for the project based off of their own self-interest and not just because we've told them to. They're really invested in the project and are willing to see it through. So what is Turk Street issue? Um, simply put, it's a really dangerous street. It's fast, it's busy. It's got three lanes of one-way traffic. It is a high injury corridor. It shows up on all of the maps um, as they relate to serious and fatal injuries due to collisions. There's an interesting dynamic also with Golden Gate Avenue. Uh, so Turk is the westbound equivalent to Golden Gate Avenue, which is eastbound. And before we started the Turk Street campaign about two and a half years ago, Golden Gate Avenue actually got a buffered bike lane. And so as a result, people were using Turk as the sister street in the bike network and were riding on it in greater numbers. But we knew pretty quickly that the buffered bike lane on Golden Gate didn't work. It actually failed quite publicly. So this slide kind of illustrates what's going on. When I talk about a buffered bike lane, I mean that the only thing separating this person riding from the moving traffic is this uh, painted buffer, two, three feet, no vertical separation, no physical separation. And so this person riding, if you're riding on this street, 
Um, you're sandwiched in between a row of parked cars and two lanes of uh, oftentimes fast moving traffic. So what was happening on Golden Gate is this right here. Cars were using the bike lane as, uh, as another travel lane. And uh, during peak hours, we saw dozens of vehicles lined up for blocks using this as a turning lane onto market. And so this picked up with our membership. The media got it. Uh, blew up on Twitter, the supervisor commented on it. So when I say it was public, it was, it was really public. Everybody knew that this bike lane design on Golden Gate was, was frankly crap. Um, and so going into the Turf Street campaign, we knew we needed something better. We knew we couldn't have this design repeated uh, because it would lead to these dangerous conditions. We needed a protected bike lane on Turk, uh, really at all costs. So this is what Turk Street uh, looked like then, still looks like this today. Um, three lanes, fast moving traffic. Uh, two parking lanes. If you're this guy right here, you're not having a great time. It's really tough. So we know what the issue is. We know what our goal is here. We want protected bike lanes on Turk. And we move into power analysis. It's really important to understand before starting off organizing around these projects, the stakeholder context of a neighborhood. And Turk Street in the Tenderloin is a really particular case. Um, the first reason being that we don't have too many bicycle coalition members in the area. This is not like the mission or um, you know, the cash flow, we have huge numbers of members. Um, it's a little bit more sparse here. And we do have a few, but um, not enough to carry this campaign on its own. People do ride bikes, especially with Golden Gate Avenue going in. People are riding bikes on Turk Street, both in the street and on the sidewalk. Uh, the Tenderloin, but Turk Street especially, has a ton of service providers. Um, and so that leads to special loading needs for people with disabilities, for the seniors that are accessing the services, all things that are really important to take into account when crafting this campaign. The residential character of the neighborhood is particular. It's mostly tenant buildings, uh, SRO, single resident occupancy buildings. Uh, so lower income folks, really high density. Not too many people are driving or parking their cars. A lot of people are walking or biking to get around. Uh, so street safety is a big concern for them as well. And the business character is particular as well. It's mostly bars and corner stores. It's not a typical um, bustling commercial corridor. Politically, it's an interesting situation in the Tenderloin as well. The reason that Turk Street and all the other streets in the Tenderloin are fast one ways is because they were designed as such to get people out of the neighborhood, either onto the freeways uh, or into the outer neighborhoods. And so the neighborhood has suffered from that historic disinvestment. But with renewed investment, like these projects that I'm talking about, there's a fear of gentrification that um, these things are being built not for the folks that are living there currently, but for new residents that would eventually displace people living in the area. So keeping that in mind throughout and working with neighborhood folks was a top priority for us in this campaign. The supervisor uh, is active in the neighborhood, friendly to us, which was a really big asset, and also to the Tenderloin folks, it's Jane Kim. Um, but that paired with a risk-averse SFMTA, who was really unwilling to push any visionary or significant designs to begin with, facing fire department concerns, made this a really challenging lift for us. But uh, between those two, we knew we had our targets. We knew we had to move the supervisor. And more importantly, we had to move the SFMTA board of directors, who were really reluctant to move this project forward um, in any real way. So. We have the context of the street, and it was time then, this is about a year and a half, two years ago, to grow our base and build our powers that related to Turk Street. So I went about building a coalition of folks. The first step was reaching out to the tenant organizers. A lot of people are doing great work with tenant buildings, um, organizing the tenants there, working with them to understand what our mutual issues were. Um, and through meetings and um, relationship building, I started to understand that there are a lot of mutual issues there. Um, especially as it relates to street safety, vehicular safety. Um, they have many of the same concerns that we do. Um, Kevin Stoll, one of the tenant organizers, is also on the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Committee. They have people that they organize that are dealing with the unsafe conditions as pedestrians and also uh, as bicyclists. So they became natural allies in this um, and were able to buy into the project as well and eventually become champions. Senior centers uh, initially had pretty serious concerns about their loading needs. And we knew we couldn't advocate for a project that would impede their loading needs in any way. We wanted something that would, you know, minimum, not impact at all, and at best, streamline the process, make it better for them. Um, so we worked pretty hand in glove with Curry Senior Center on Leavenworth to determine how they needed their loading, especially 
given their special needs, they have um, a mammogram van that comes every month, a dental hygiene van to serve their clients. All these things really needed curb side access, which doesn't always fit with a bike lane. And so we had many meetings with them and the SFMTA to figure out how we could fit those things together and how we could build a project that was really beneficial for everybody. Um, and same thing for the businesses. Uh, I did door to door several times on Turk Street uh, and learned some interesting things. Businesses are rarely supporters of bike lane projects because of parking concerns. Usually these things, um, and this is no exception, knock out a good amount of street parking. But the businesses on Turk Street, uh, their customers were not driving and parking to their stores. And they had concerns about street crime as it related to the on-street parking. They were seeing uh, drug activity happening in parked cars or around parked cars. And so their hope was that in removing a lot of the street parking, this project could actually improve the quality of life on their block and in front of their store. So unexpected allies there, but um, something that I discovered through really working with these folks and talking to them um, many, many times. We've got a coalition together. Um, it was also really important to consider obstacles that we had and potential opposition. One really big one on Turk Street was the San Francisco Fire Department. They had operational concerns as it related to um, the overhead wires on Turk Street and park and protected bike lanes. They were concerned that the bike lane would impede their ability to deploy their ladder trucks. Um, something that we, of course, took very seriously. We don't want to impede fire operations through our projects, especially not in a neighborhood as dense as the Tenderloin. And then inevitably with parking and loading changes, uh, people are uneasy about the change, concerned about how it will work once in the ground. So we have been pushing this MTA and we'll continue to work with them about evaluating the project and iterating upon it when necessary, making sure that this isn't just something that goes in the ground and that's it, but that this is actually a living project and that concerns can be incorporated into the design after implementation. That's really important, especially when we're seeing these projects like 7th and 8th that have really quick turnarounds. Oftentimes you can't work out all the kinks and so it's important to go back and, and work through those things. So we know who our supporters are. We've grown our base. We've built a good amount of power. A lot of it is coming from within the neighborhood. We've got direct stakeholder buy-in, a lot of people who are living, working, providing services on the street um, are for this project and pushing for it how they're becoming champions. And then it became time to convince our decision makers, the supervisor, the SFMT board of directors, that this is something that we needed to prioritize and push through even though it was politically difficult given concerns from the fire department. So what does that look like? Uh, the first is public meetings. Uh, we turned out to a lot of public meetings for this. This is a picture outside of a hearing room at City Hall. Um, the SFMTA had proposed a buffered bike lane, the same one that was on Golden Gate for Turk Street. We knew it wasn't going to work, and so we, we took a really historic step for organization. We opposed a bike lane project. We had never done that before, but in this case, we knew it wasn't going to work. And so we turned out here we've got Gil Seagrave, Stephen Tennis from Safe Passages, um, from the tenant organization. And I actually I did gloss over the youth programs here, which is Stephen Tennis. Um, he's from Safe Passages. They uh, put corner captains along a predetermined route every day after school so that they can not only be crossing guards for the kids coming out of school, but also shield them from drug activity, crime that is happening on the streets. And so they were a really important um, component of our campaign as well. Stephen especially, he became a real strong champion for the project. Um, Mary Kate Shin, who runs Yellow Bike, a uh, nonprofit that distributes bicycles in the neighborhood, also a representative of the district on the Bicycle Advisory Committee, some of our members. And uh, so with this group showing up at City Hall at what was initially supposed to be a procedural step for the buffered bike lane project, we were actually able to turn out the supervisor herself in opposition, uh, which, which rarely happens, but when it does, it's incredibly powerful. And so at this meeting, she compelled the SFMTA to go back to the drawing board and rework the project in a way that would be suitable for all of us in this group of uh, group of people here. So we, we went back to the drawing board, um, designing a protected bike lane that worked for all the folks on the street was no easy task and the SFMTA, credit to them, went through I would say dozens of design iterations. I only saw about half a dozen of them. Um, this is one, I guess I would call it on street walk through meeting that we had with the fire department, um, the senior centers there, the tenant organizers, myself, the supervisor, 
Uh, the goal of this was for them to show us exactly what they meant by um, what their concerns were about a protected bike lane and how it would affect their operations. So they brought out the ladder truck and they showed us and um, with that we were able to inform the design, we were able to come to some sense of mutual understanding. But it wasn't just with them, this is just the, the biggest example of that. Uh, multiple meetings with every stakeholder and SFMT in the room to really hash out block by block, even in some cases foot by foot, what this bike lane would look like to make sure that it really fit the needs of the neighborhood and all of the users that would be eventually uh, hopefully riding on this protected bike lane. So this is this is what we came up with. Uh, this is sort of the, the end result um, and I'll walk through this. So we're looking west on Turk. These vehicles are all moving away from us. And so immediately following the curb, we've got a six foot bike lane. It's really important that it's curbside. It means that uh, no vehicles are going to be crossing it to get to um, to get to the curb. There's no parking lane there. It's a bike lane curbside. Of course, there needs to be access to driveways, but there are special treatments around those to shore up protection for cyclists. This is followed immediately by three-foot buffer with uh, bollards, and so these are uh, plastic posts of some type, usually with a base that offer physical and some real pro or perceived, and also some real protection for people riding. The really novel part of this design is this very large buffer on the outside of the vertical protection. So this is a seven plus foot buffer that runs the length of the corridor and that doubles up as a buffer for people riding between them and the actual moving vehicles and active loading. And so people are able to use this to drop off passengers, to drop off goods, to use it as a loading. And so for a loading zone, for many of the businesses, it actually increased the amount of space available to them to load their goods. Um, and so it was an acceptable solution. Of course, this is a newer design, so we worked with the FMTA to put together an enforcement plan. Um, what are you going to be doing if people aren't respecting the loading zones, things like that? Um, so it'll be important to keep that in mind moving forward. Um, and then another really important part of the project is just the, the road diet that comes with it. This is reducing a travel lane. So we're taking away one of the three travel lanes and narrowing the other two. So right off the bat, that's going to slow down vehicles, reduce traffic volumes, uh, and increase general pedestrian safety hugely. And then the north side parking lane is retained here. This is a little bit of a technical drawing, but I did want to call out, this is the special loading zone at the senior center. This is Leavenworth right here. And so you'll see on the near side of this intersection, the configuration that I just talked about, the bike lane, the bollards, the buffer, and it switches through the intersection. Um, giving the senior center access to the curb for their vans, for their loading, um, and pushing people biking to the outside. This was a compromise on our end, but uh, having the sorting happening in the intersection was better than having a weaving in and out of the bike lane, which we had seen before and we knew really didn't, really didn't work out. Um, and we're hoping there are ways to continue to shore this up, potentially bike signals, uh, but all of that again through the evaluation of the project and hopefully reallocation of resources to come back and revisit some of the problem areas as they as they pop up. So we had this design put together. Uh, everybody was pretty much on board. We were feeling good. Um, and so we were ready to push it through approvals. So Supervisor James came at, at this point. Um, she had all of our buy-ins. She was supportive. Um, the next step was to convince the SFMTA Board of Directors that this was a project that needed to happen and that needed to be approved. So this is the scene at an SFMTA board meeting. Um, it's a big room. This doesn't really do it justice. Um, but you'll see our members with green stickers on, a lot of the neighborhood folks in the building. Uh, it turned out dozens of people at multiple meetings to really push this project forward and convince the SFMTA board that they need to approve this. For those of you who don't know how this works, everybody gets two minutes. And so if you get dozens of people, um, in support takes a lot of time, um, and it can be really powerful if you have the right folks. Um, this is one of those right folks. This is Stephen Tennis uh, of Tenderloin Safe Passages. He brought his safety vest. Uh, this is a man that stands hours every day on uh, the corner of Turk to help the children walking through, uh, and as such has perspective like nobody else. This is a really powerful public comment. It's hard to say no when neighborhood folks come out in these numbers. Um, and so you imagine two hours of this, you can see their faces, they're getting a little bit, <laughs> a little bit bored, but um, it drives the point home. And um, 
as a result of all that turnout, we got unanimous approval. So the project was approved by the SFMT Board of Directors. This was in January of this year, so fairly recently. Um, and it is currently moving towards construction. So thankfully here we do get to celebrate. We did win. Uh, we got the project that we wanted approved. Um, and we're looking forward to breaking ground. This is not Turk Street. It hasn't broken ground yet. And it won't actually break ground because it's paint and posts. It'll be sort of glued down. Uh, but we'll be able to celebrate this as a victory for the neighborhood, as a victory for biking in San Francisco, as an addition to our bicycle network, um, and new safety improvements to a street that's incredibly dangerous. The hope throughout this whole process is that Turk Street will drop off the high injury network and we won't see so many people's lives impacted by traffic violence as they have been in the past on Turk Street and in the larger Tenderloin neighborhood. Um, with that, I'll take questions. What happens to the car traffic? Yeah. So SFMTA models uh, supported it going down to two lanes. Those three lanes weren't being utilized. We don't know. It hasn't been built yet. Again, um, evaluation will be crucial to the success, to the success of this project. But um, based off of the city's modeling, it shouldn't have adverse impacts. That's a great question. So JFK Drive, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it was the first iteration of Park and Protected by Clean in San Francisco, and we know it had significant flaws. And let me actually just jump back to um, 7th and 8th Street. So what you're referring to is people are bleeding into this um, buffer zone here. They don't leave that hashtag area. Sure, and so then they open their doors into the bike lane, and it, and they have sure. Jobs. Yeah. Our recent efforts in Golden Gate Park have been more focused on traffic calming, speed humps, slowing vehicles down. Uh, we haven't been successful. We've been pushing Reckon Park. This is a different jurisdiction, so it's a little bit trickier working with that agency um, to build in vertical protection. One change that we've seen on this bike lane since this picture was taken is they've implemented um, plastic posts along the buffer to really force the issue in terms of compliance and not have cars bleed over into the buffer zone, which is really important for doors opening and people loading. It's also a disability access lane. That hasn't happened on Golden Gate, uh, though we've been pushing for it. There are some aesthetic concerns. Um, in terms of how we would get a new version of that bike lane, um, it would take a new street campaign. It would take a lot of member buy-in. Um, it would be a, a process. Definitely. Uh, the new, so you're referring to the near-term bike lanes on Folsom from uh, 11th to 7th. Um, it's a great question. Those are brand new. It's the newest protected bike lane. We've taken a lot of member feedback about those, especially as it relates to crossings at the alleys and at driveways. So there's a few things that can be done. I'm currently working with the project manager, put together an evaluation ride, things like that, hoping you would join. Um, the first thing is marking more clearly through those intersections that it's a bike lane. Right now we have hash green marks, which don't quite cut it. I want to see more green um, advanced limit lines so that the people pulling out know to stop and look for bike traffic. That's the first step. Um, for people pulling in, I think we can do more daylighting, sort of bringing the uh, parked cars back so there's better lines of sight. Regardless of the solution, so I'm not a traffic engineer, but I know that it's an issue I hear from people like you, I hear from our members, and we can bring that to the city and push them to make improvements, whatever those might look like. Double parking, parking the bike lane is a huge issue. We see it citywide. Uh, Lake is one. I think Valencia is a, is a really great example of that. Um, it's a couple things. I think the biggest one is building better bike lanes. We know we can build bike lanes that preclude the possibility of double parking in them. If there's a concrete barrier between the bike lane and the moving vehicles, you're not going to hop that to double park in a bike lane. Um, the second thing is education, um, working with professional drivers, so that they know not to park in the bike lanes. A little bit, something else we can do to help with that issue. Um, but I think the best thing is to engineer better bike lanes and push for designs that we know will knock out the possibility of double parking. Um, I can't speak as much the Yerba Buena drop off. I'm not as familiar. Um, the hairball, I am quite familiar. That's actually one of my projects. Um, there's a few things that we can do. The first is uh, we pushed really hard for protected bike lanes to be built at the entrances to the hairball, uh, which are some of the more confusing points and some of the most dangerous areas. Uh, soon to be constructed is actually a protected bike lane on Gerald, which is the street parallel to Bayshore that people use to go northbound through the hairball. 
Wayfinding is another part of it. Um, the same thing, we're looking for improvements, uh, the eastbound entrance on Cesar Chavez. Um, we're also having conversations at the funding level as to what could be done for the whole area. We need to have a comprehensive plan there. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate the, the questions. <laughs>